can still hear you. everybody and welcome to Good Tech, an ongoing discussion around eth ethics and technology. I'm Elizabeth Perry with IDCA. As a reminder, if you have any questions or comments during the show, you can dial the number on your screen right below me and we'll get you in on the discussion. We've talked a lot about the use and misuse of our personal information online. Data, it's been said, is now more valuable than oil. But just how much is it worth? Um, today, we're going to take an even closer look at the value of your personal data online, your digital you, and just exactly how is it used by whom and what do they have on you. According to today's guest, your online personality may be a lot different than your so-called real one. Uh, taking a deeper look may surprise you, but there may be ways to better and more ethically manage your data online. Please welcome. CEO and founder of Citizen Me, St. John or Sinjin Deacons. Hi there. Great to have you on the show today, Sinjin. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, first off, since we're going to talk about personal data, let's define it. How would you define it? What exactly do we mean by personal data? So personal data is a, it's a lot more than um, kind of uh, the, the bits and bytes that are held on Facebook. It's kind of anything that's digitally held, which defines you. So it can be anything from, of course, kind of social media or online, but it can also be kind of everything through loyalty programs. And if you think about what you do with, say, government services, it could be it's your health records, it's your uh, kind of passport information, your date of birth information. Um, and then actually more importantly, it's everything that you do kind of day to day. We all have smartphones in our pockets. We've got probably each of us 20 or 30 apps you're pinging back home and sending data around the world uh, back to kind of mothership. Um, all of that data together creates a huge cloud, which is kind of constantly being updated about you. Um, so there's, there's this plethora of data. The, the big issue we have at the moment is we're just not able to view it. We don't understand we can't see where it is. There's no, there's very limited transparency. Um, mm -hmm. That leads to lots of kind of knock on effects, like in, including people being slightly creeped out about things that happen. We can't kind of quite understand what's happening in the digital world. We wonder why ads are, ads are following us around the, the, the internet, that kind of thing. Um, there are, there's a much better way of us managing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that answers my, my question about what do they have on you? Um, is there anything else you know that people should know about what kinds of information they have to be careful with? Or um, I think in terms of um, it's not so much being careful. It's that it's more like uh, we have a kind of a digital mirror, so a di digital kind of version of, of, of who we are. So mm -hmm. everything that kind of exists about us is becoming digitized. Um, so in that kind of world, we have kind of a in, increasing depths of data kind of which become available. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of that data, I think, for instance, kind of those um, just in the last kind of week, for instance, it turns out Google's been uh, working with physicians, providing them with free services, but actually kind of pulling in huge amounts of health data. Um, and, and the issue we have is that we don't have transparency of that happening, and we also don't um, have control over the way that happens. Um, and that's kind of a, a massive issue for us. Right. And it's, it's huge right now. It's like white hot uh, and hopefully getting even hotter um, subject to talk about. And, and people are putting it in their political agendas and their um, campaigns, which is, which is 
actually a good thing. Um, so Citizen Me offers users the ability to analyze their online personality using psychological tests. And you mentioned Cambridge University. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? What, what, what exactly are we, are we meaning by psychological tests and how does that work? So we, um, there's a huge amount of data about us that exists out there. So what we enable people to do is um, do kind of fun interactions and in the process kind of pull in a copy of their data from around the internet. And that could be anything from your smart meter data and your energy usage through to your, you know, eventually your, 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 your car information, your telematics, health information, banking information, everything else. Um, when you put that together, it kind of creates a story about you. Um, the data on, its, on itself is, is, doesn't kind of tell much of a story, but when you apply kind of algorithms to it, you can basically reveal things about yourself. Um, so for the psychometric stuff, uh, very simply, we kind of apply some algorithms where you can look at kind of background information like your tweets or your social media interactions or kind of likes on Facebook, that kind of thing. Um, or it could even be things like your app usage information, which is kind of available on your phone. Um, you apply algorithms to that and it can kind of give you insights about kind of how extrovert you are, open, agreeable, your mood state, um, your life satisfaction levels based on your kind of activity over the last week, that kind of thing. Um, um, that can, as I say, that can be kind of lots of social media interactions. It could be things like your interactions with the real world, your step count information, uh, your Spotify playlists, et cetera. Um, so all of that together creates the ability to kind of provide these, these stories about you. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, go you ahead. Should, you get them first before anyone else, and then you can decide what to do with them. So this is kind of like a personality. I mean, it's like another personality. And how does it differ from your so-called, you know, real personality? Isn't there a, a can't there be a, a big difference? I mean, it depends on how good the algorithms are. Um, so the algorithms. Uh, might be kind of 20, 30, 40% accurate. Um, some of them can be actually a more, lot more accurate than that. So things like uh, openness and conscientiousness that we can pick up from, say, social media behavior, about kind of 80% accurate, uh, mm -hmm. which is getting up to kind of medical grade research kind of accuracy. Um, at that level, um, the algorithms actually kind of become better than maybe close friends in terms of understanding who you are in the moment. And that kind of gets a bit scary, right? So uh, a lot of big companies are working on these kind of algorithms to try and understand audiences, generally kind of commercial marketing audiences. Um, what we're trying to do is give, as I say, your, give you your copy of those algorithms first and those insights. Um, so you can then decide how you want to represent yourself digitally in different places. Wow, it's kind of scary. Um talking about how I mean because we do things differently online in my opinion you know like people hide behind their computer screens and oh since so and so isn't there to like punch me in the face <laughs> I can say whatever I want so it just seems to me that there there is kind of a difference in the way that you're portraying yourself or that you're it's, it's online I think I mean that there are different just like in real life um, in real life, you have kind of um, different places you go to and you have different personalities in different contexts, right? So for uh, me, tomorrow, tomorrow night, I'm a team doing karaoke. I'm going to be a slightly different person doing karaoke than with my mom and dad last <laughs> Sunday for, for Sunday lunch, right? Um, so we have kind of slightly different, but the same person, but we kind of display slightly different kind of attributes of who we are. So if you're in a, a semi-anonymous environment, like say Twitter, where people can, can hide who they are, they then feel kind of able to kind of act in a slightly different way to maybe how they would if they were in person talking face to face with someone, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we, those kind of personalities in different contexts are, are really fascinating. It's just like real life. It's the same in a digital environment. Um, the, I guess the, the key thing is trying to work out who we are in those different contexts, how we want to behave and be seen in those contexts, and also mm -hmm. how we want to interact. So if we were interacting with services, um, if I'm interacting with my bank and applying for a mortgage, I want to be a particular persona. Um, if I'm kind of talking to a group of kind of old school friends on what, I'll be a 
in a certain way. Um, so just like in a in real life, we're different people in different places. And it's that kind of nuance and um, sophistication, which I don't think we've really got to just yet. We're kind of starting, starting to get into that kind of space at the moment. So is that kind of going beyond kind of very crude kind of lookalikes and, and seeing a digital environment as being something we go to and starting to understand that kind of a digital version of us is just like a real life version. But as I said, we've all got phones in our pockets or in our purses around us. It's the first thing we look at in the morning. It's the last thing we look at at night. Um, it's very, very personal. And our phones basically are picking up huge amounts of information. We have a smartwatch, you're picking up things like heart rate and sleep patterns, um, when you should stand up, if you've got an Apple watch and get a little kind of like notification. Um, so the, the real life world and digital world are blending very, very quickly and becoming one. Um, and that, that's a really big shift for us all. Yeah, yeah, it's it it is fair to say I think at this point there there's really a you know no line and it's being blurred um between the two worlds but and so back to citizen me I know you also um aside from being able to take people's information and sort of show people that personality or or whatever information that they're sharing um you also promote a fair exchange of information. We'll get to that. Um, but let's go back a little bit to the evolution of Citizen Me. Um, you launched in beta in 2016, correct? Actually, we had a first version of the application in 2014. So the the, the, okay. of, the of the platform of the, of the company is basically to empower people their own data and give everyone, give all of us access to the value of the data that's there. Um, the mm -hmm. first version of the application was um, much more about kind of putting you in control and locking down um, the sharing of data so you're not leaking data everywhere. Uh, so it kind of told you for the top 30 or so apps, kind of which apps were good and bad with your data. You could tap on kind of um, a particular app like say Facebook and go and lock down some of the settings and take you directly into your settings. So you can kind of control how your data is managed. Um, we also had kind of like a dashboard so you could kind of change your profile picture on different social media in one place. And then we also showed you your personality as it appeared on Facebook. Uh, and from that, we realized that actually for the lockdown piece, anything which is more than switching on an ad blocker, uh, people kind of uh, will get involved to start off with, but the, the, the retention and kind of people coming back into that is too much like admin and no one wants admin, right? So mm -hmm. what we found was that actually the, in terms of the Interaction. The, the driver for interaction is much more about helping people understand how they're perceived and how they look, um, understand themselves better, and that drove a lot of lot of attention, a lot of traffic. Um, so we mm -hmm. then had to go through kind of this pivot. We looked at kind of where, for mass market, how are people really going to engage with their data, and how can you educate people about what their data means? And we had the second version of the app, which went out on the store in about 2016. Um, and that version of the app is actually much more about giving you fun activities where you can collect a copy of your data from lots of different places onto your own smartphone. Um, so that data, every time you do a little activity, like tell me my personality on Twitter, you're pulling your Twitter profile or pulling in your, you know, tell me about my neighbors in my, based on census data, uh, how many people were born in my neighborhood. Um, you're pulling in US or UK census data. So every time you're, you're doing one of those little activities, you get a little kind of moment of a delight, a little, uh, uh -huh. um, and you've populated a data store. Every time you populate the data store, you're basically getting more and more value. You're, you're collecting more value for yourself. Um, once you have that kind of data, you can then do one of two things. You can either donate it um, or, for instance, to charity, to, to um, health research, etc., cetera, uh, anonymously, or you can transact it for cash. Uh, and it's the donation, combination of donation and transaction for cash, which kind of drive kind of that kind of ongoing engagement. So as well as getting kind of mm -hmm. self-revelation, you can also choose to to, add, to gain gain value. Um, so, so yeah, so there's a lot to it now. I realize it's gone through quite an evolution. Um, but just let's back up for a minute and talk okay. about your vision and your aha moment. Um, what 
how did this come about? I mean, what did what made you decide to to launch this Citizen Me? So I um I, my last company I the kind of 2011 kind of a sort of my last company uh, and I helped about 100 million people get on the internet um, with kind of mobile video and kind of and data platforms. Um, and then you kind of have, I was looking at kind of what my next project was going to be and kind of you want to do something altruistic because you just sort of company you made a bit of money. And my two kids at the time were kind of about seven and eight. Uh, my two daughters, I was looking at kind of what can I do that's really going to have an impact for them through the century, right? So they're, they're growing up through the century where everything's becoming digital. Um, if you're a kind of 10, 15 year old child now, you basically are used to having devices. You can't imagine a time where people didn't have a mobile phone, a smartphone. Um, it's a kind of very, very different world. You, you kind of live digitally. Um, and that's just the start of the shift we're going through. We've got things like AR, VR coming through with so augmented reality and virtual reality coming through with 5G in the next two, two to five years. Um, we have ubiquitous sensors everywhere. We have AI um, increasingly part of pretty much every, every platform, every product. Um, ubiquitous social media, so we live online as much as offline. Um, in that world where everything becomes AI driven, um, all of the training data for that is based on personal data. And if you, you have a world which is driven by personal data and none of us have control, you very quickly get into some really dystopian, horrible kind of scenarios, right? It's all very kind of black mirror. Um, and those things actually kind of like, we think about kind of black mirror being kind of slightly sci-fi, but actually they're not, the, the reason why that kind of series works so well is because they're not that kind of un, unreal from, from where we are now. If you look at kind of Uyghurs in China and kind of what's happening with them in terms of tracking on social networks and, um, and using smartphones, it's all very possible. So the, the, the solution to that is giving us all the ability to participate with our data, giving us all very easy and simple ways to participate. Uh, and that's what kind of citizen is about. And for, for me, if I can do that, my, my kids then, we can nudge the internet just slightly towards the good. You know, like five years, 10 years down the track, we'll be in a much, much better place than where we are now, right? Right. And um, that's the, the drive. Yeah, well, we, you know, we talk a lot about that at IDCA because um, not having control, I mean, I know you're involved with my data as well. That's right. Correct. Yeah. My data is, you know, all about, for those who don't know, it's all about, you know, taking control of your data and owning it um, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, and it's, it's scary. We've talked about that a lot on this show, but let's talk specifics and what you know what could happen if we don't take back control of our data like uh, what could happen to your kids how could it go bad what can they use again how can they use it against us um yeah I, so for me I, if we're looking at kind of 10 20 30 years out right i mean mm -hmm. we most of the data at the moment is going into one of four or five big silos uh, right. I mean, every industry basically runs on directly or indirectly will run on personal data because you need to optimize whatever your product services for, for end users. Um, mm -hmm. But there are kind of a few big kind of data monopolies and the end game for those, those companies, you look at including Apple, um, the, the more data you can collect around an individual, the more you can basically provide kind of um, algorithms and AI, which then provide kind of insights for them and drive services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I think the end game is um, you have almost like a telepathic AI where you have so much data on an individual that everything around us just happens seamlessly, right? So you don't need to talk to Alexa, things just happen. I get into, I get into my car and the car, which is also automated, obviously, and electric, but I get into my car and the, you know, it's, it's the right podcast playing and um, the, the seat height is right and the, 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 the heating's right. My daughter gets in the car and it switches to a, a music station or whatever else, right? All of that stuff will happen automatically, but it can only happen automatically and almost telepathically if you have almost complete data around an individual because you need to know exact mood state in the moment, situationally, contextually, everything else. Uh, and that drive there means that either Google or Facebook or Apple, maybe Amazon, 
have huge amounts of personal data to try and drive those services. Uh, and that gets kind of scary because it means that it, to be easy, it's, in, it's invisible to you, but all of your personal data then sits in someone else's cloud and all of the algorithms and the AI and the kind of brain effectively that helps around your life is owned by someone else. Uh, that's right. even in a liberal democracy, that's not kind of a great place to be where we have two or three companies that basically kind of run the world, right? Um, so you have to have alternatives to that. Um, so with Citizen Me, it's not that we're competing against those, those companies. It's more, there's just another way, right? As well as Google and Facebook having lots and lots of data about you, you also have your own personal store. And if you're the person who kind of collects that, from every area of your life, full 360, everything you do, then you have the best possible version of you. You have the best version of the digital you. And that becomes then very, very powerful, right? Because collectively, if we all have the best versions of us, then we're in a much better place to kind of negotiate and get the services we want, right? So then as a, as a crowd, as a, as a group, those services work for us instead of us kind of being part of other, other services. Um, so that's kind of that's that's kind of the big drive, and if you that's in liberal democracies where we have regulations and rules, and you know DNA information can't be used by insurance companies and that kind of thing, right? But if you live in other countries where they don't, they're not lucky enough to have those kind of um, protections, then things get quite scary very quickly because you get disinformation, um, you get kind of like broken democracies, uh, you get kind of minorities being oppressed and you can already see that happening because technology is incredibly powerful. Right? Yeah. Well, there's, and, and let's talk, you know, manipulation is a, is a real thing with some of these, uh, you know, democracy is, well, we talked about this on, on other shows, but we won't get too far into it, but democracies that have been threatened by the amount of information and the amount of yeah. manipulation and control that actual like big tech or WeChat or um, you know some of these these big players have, but let's get back to um, citizening because I know it's not just about giving people access to their data, but it's also about you've created this um, client exchange platform. Hmm. Um, in other words, people can, you know, people who have opted in, well, I'll let you explain, but people who have opted into the system, companies like PR firms or, you know, can come in and benefit from access to this. Can you tell me how that works? Yeah. So currently there's a trillion dollar marketplace for personal data, um, but none of us can participate in it. So you got this trillion dollar global marketplace for personal data. Um, using all of our data, but none of us participate and, uh, and all the transactions really kind of happen behind the scenes. Um, kind of large data brokers kind of buying and selling trying to keep data together. Uh, now regulations coming through, which is starting to kind of damp down that marketplace. Um, but that market could be worth way, way more if we could all choose to, to participate on our terms transparently and, and choose how and where we do so. Right? So for the, the, the way we kind of enable that to happen, firstly, you have to give people a copy of their own data um, from various different places. Um, you give people kind of transparency about what's happening with that data, you give them the insights, but then you also let them transact. The first place to do that is the insights industry, which is the kind of the ethical part of the di digital marketing ecosystem, where you already have kind of anonymity and you already have kind of you know, below 16s can't, can't interact and things. Um, so we, as a first first market we're in, basically is the insights marketplace where large organizations can go and speak to five, 10,000 people and, and ask them for, not just kind of the answer to one or two questions, but also ask them for the data around that. So for instance, ask people for, you know, two or three questions plus their step count information or what their favorite apps are across the last month. Uh, and that information is just available in the background. Um, for a large organization, if you're, say, um, a large movie studio about to launch a streaming service, um, you can see what other apps people have on their phone. If you can see that, if you're Disney Plus, you can see that people have um, Amazon streaming and Netflix and maybe two or three other streaming services on their phones. And you can then deeply understand kind of your target market and your, the, the people that you want to go and reach and, and 
how you should talk to them through psychometrics and, and emotional info, uh, as also, also and also which kind of channels would be best to speak to those those individuals. So it gives you kind of very very deep in the moment information, but you can go and speak to those thousands of people in maybe half an hour an hour um, just by asking them whether they'd like to transact. So you can very very quickly get kind of immediate information and then do kind of things like clustering analysis and segmentations off the back of that. Uh, all of that traditionally would take maybe three or four weeks and we can do that in half an hour, maybe an hour. Uh, so by enabling people to participate in real time, you kind of outcompete any of those existing traditional marketplaces and you do that with your own data. Is the, is the, is the, the data, um, I don't know how to put this, but I mean, when you think about just, it's just the people that opt in, right? How yeah. do you, how do you sort of place value on, or, or like what kinds of people um, are actually opting in? And does that throw off your analytics if, if like only a certain segment is opting in? And I don't know, I mean, do you know what I mean? Can you, can you? Yeah, it's, it's, a mobile, it's a mobile application. So we generally, for most markets, we're in the first thousand people are between the age of, 20, of 18 and 24. Okay. Uh, but then when we get up to kind of three, four, 5,000 people, it's, it's about 25 to 35 year olds are the, the, the main grouping. Um, because of the different types of activity, you have a lot more, um, uh, got a lot broader spread than a traditional market research application. A, you know, if you think about the, your friends who would do market research surveys is probably a subset of all of your friends. Um, if you have the ability to kind of donate to char charity and to find out information about yourself, um, it immediately kind of broadens out as well as obviously the, the kind of the movement element of kind of like you reclaiming your data. Um, so we generally kind of much, much broader across kind of um, the society and across demographics, we tend to drop off off with kind of over 45, 50 year olds. Um, and that's actually more of a reflection of people using apps on smartphones. Um, so we're kind of a millennial, very strong millennials uh, going into Gen Z as they come through as well. Yeah, that was one of my, my questions further down the line, but um, I might as well get into it now. You mentioned millennials mm -hmm. um, and it kind of brings to mind like, we've been we've been giving away our data for a long time and are the millennials the ones who can be saved i mean are they <laughs> is it not too late for them and too late for us kind of thing it's really it's fascinating right because if you look at the ways that people kind of manage the data I mean, people who are, are maybe the jacks this is all a bit new you know, weren't brought up with smartphones, et cetera. And so basically the, the ways that say Gen X versus millennials versus Gen Z kind of deal with things are very, very different. Um, so my daughter's what, 15, she's got 20 different Instagram accounts. She has different accounts for different groups of people. Some are anonymized, wow. some are her. Um, if you look at things like Snap with kind of ephemerality of, of messaging, there are lots of kind of tools and ways that people kind of manage the way that their persona exists, right? Um, and it's kind of people maybe over the age of 35, 40 who have been brought, been brought up with it, who, well, I mean, most of my accounts are my name um, and it's much more literal. If you're kind of a 15 year old, um, you'll have lots and lots of different personas. So the way that maybe in real life, teenagers used to try out different identities in, in the real world and every six months would change kind of what they're into and that kind of thing. Maybe people are kind of doing that in a digital way and they're working out ways of mm. doing it. Now, at the same time, obviously, they're leaking lots and lots of data. Um, I think millennials kind of probably leak the most. Um, I think for Gen okay. Z, they're probably going to be a little bit more safeguarded in some countries, even Europe, uh, you know, Singapore, Australia, Japan's coming through with new regulation. So I think 10 years' time, kind of generations coming through will have a lot more protections. And this, this has probably been the period where there's been the most amount of data about the most amount of people without protections in place. So what sort of value does the client get with CitizenMe that they can't get anywhere else? 
So for, for a large brand, um, you can immediately see kind of in the moment what people are thinking and with huge amounts of kind of background information. Um, you can immediately kind of uh, uh, understand why a particular cluster of people like this one particular shampoo versus another, not just in terms of kind of like kind of the look of a bottle, but basically in terms of the brand positioning, the, the emotional resonance of the uh, of the, the branding. Um, you can look at kind of clustering based on kind of rural, urban, age, demographics, fitness levels. Um, really interesting stuff like um, if you're launching a, an eco shampoo, just to use the same example, um, you can see things like um, how eco-centric people say they are versus how e eco-centrically they really behave. So um, I might think that I'm pretty good. I, I do my recycling once a week and kind of I make sure I recycle kind of bottles and that kind of thing. Um, if you look at my household energy consumption based on my smart meter data usage, we use the tumble dryer five or six times a week and we fly a lot, which you'll see on my spending habit. Um, so actually my carbon footprint is fairly crappy. But so my carbon footprint in reality is fairly crappy, but I self perceive as being someone who kind of cares about the environment. So I'll probably go and buy that Procter & Gamble Unilever Eco Shampoo, um, mm -hmm. which resonates with me in terms of who I think I am and how I like to see myself. The reality might be slightly different. Um, and it's having that kind of level of nuance and depth of, of understanding, which is really, really powerful for, for a brand, right? Um, if I was really, really kind of eco-aware, I wouldn't buy anything from Procter & Gamble or Unilever, maybe. Right? So let's talk about how much we're worth. Um, we're talking about the value of data and, you know, how much is our data really worth? So it depends again on context, right? So, I mean, when we think about value of data, we tend to kind of think about things like uh, Facebook, I think in the States, average person is worth about 130 bucks a year. So you're paying about 130 bucks a year to use Facebook in terms of your data, um, oh, the monetization. Wow. They mm -hmm. So you are, you're paying for Facebook, it's just you're paying in data. And it's not visible to you, and they don't want it to be visible to you, but it's actually in their, their kind of company reports. Uh, same thing for, for Google, same thing for Amazon. Amazon's the third largest advertising uh, platform now. Uh, so in the US, it's Google, Facebook, Amazon are the, by far the biggest kind of advertising spend now, um, recipients of advertising spend. Um, not all runs on personal data, but it's much, much more beyond that. Um, for example, if you're going to buy a car, you might go on a, a digital, an online classifieds ad and you kind of click on a car. Um, the dealer might get paid 10 bucks for that, um, that lead, or they might pay, sorry, 10 bucks for that lead to the, the, the website. Um, if the dealer could see that you're a family of two, you're about to have a child, um, you've currently got a sports compact, you're probably going to buy an SUV. Um, you kind of are good for the money. Uh, you kind of like driving on the highway, et cetera, right? That's probably worth about 60 to sixty to 70 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the, the critical thing there is the website, instead of making 10 bucks, they can make 20 bucks. But then for you as an individual, you should be earning 40 bucks for that. So when you take a call from the dealer, you get paid 40 bucks. So you buy a car and you make maybe 150, 200 bucks for buying a car. And that's all for sharing your data to enable you to get a more personalized from the dealer when you buy the car. Uh, so any high ticket item like that, kind of buying a car, buying a holiday, buying a house, um, kind of you should be able to kind of, the, the value already in those marketplaces is there and it's just not, not it's, it's untapped. Um, there are already transactions happening, you just don't see them. And if you could participate and add your own data in, those marketplaces would become way more valuable and you should be able to get a slice of that, right? Because you're participating. Um, beyond that, there's things like medical health. Uh, medical health, again, kind of um, research by pharmaceutical companies, those kind of um, marketplaces, they already exist, but basically uh, we maybe participate, but not knowingly. Um, that's why Google's making a huge charge into the health sector, and they just bought Fitbits for health data, basically. Um, again, all those markets are opaque. We can't participate. And actually the companies that are making the money don't want us to know that we're participating because they want to keep the data from the, the money from themselves. 
the, the weird thing is if you could participate, if we could all participate, the, the actual pie would be so much bigger. So the value would be so much better, bigger, as well as us benefiting monetarily, um, everyone else would too. But it's much more than just money. Um, the value of our data is way, way more important. If we can get access to the algorithms that tell us about ourselves, so we can flourish as individuals, so we can find out things about ourselves which enable us to be um, what we might think of as better people, um, that's incredibly, incredibly valuable, right? Uh, from healthcare, physical health through to, to mental health, um, kind of positive psychology, um, kind of headspace type um, kind of services, um, but also kind of in terms of how we interact with communities, how we self-manage, how we kind of um, make more time for the things we love doing. All of those things can be kind of accentuated and help with, with access to personal data. Wow. Yeah. So it, from an ethical standpoint, you're actually, I mean, that was one of my questions you, and I think you just answered it was that from an ethical standpoint, this is a good thing to do. It's not right in your, in your view. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, we talk about ethics and technology on this show. So, but what were you going to say? Yeah, from an ethical, ethical point of view, I mean, it, I think we have to do this and it will happen. I don't know, I mean, the, in terms of having a world where we all participate, it's obvious to me, it just may take two years or 20 years, um, hopefully not 200 years, because if we go into one of those kind of um, dark places and a kind of a digital dark age, then that wouldn't be, you know, it'd take us a while to get to that, the, the place we should be. Um, but it seems to me to be obvious, right? In, in a world where we're all digitally connected, um, it's got to be about human flourishing and, and kind of empowerment of individuals. Because uh, mm -hmm. it's a much better place for us all, not just kind of economically, but also societally, right? Right. How many users are there um, so far on, um, on so the we platform? Have, we have about 200, we have 250,000 people uh, who signed up to the service and that's growing at a, between five and 10% a month. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all organic. So we basically put the apps on the app store, um, provided all these kind of services in terms of kind of you getting insights about yourself. And obviously you can donate data and, and sell data as well anonymously. Uh, and that's driven the kind of viral uptake. Um, and it's kind of funny the way that has grown. So we have some countries where uh, in Brazil, someone took, there was an article about us in the New Scientist uh, and, and someone in Brazil took that article and translated it in, into Portuguese, uh, put it on their own blog. And it, I think it was titled kind of like make money, make the money that Facebook earns from you kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and that went viral in Brazil. And we ended up with like 30, 40,000 people signing up to the platform. Um, wow. And it really kind of took off very quickly. I had the same sort of thing happening in Vietnam. We got these kind of little spikes where kind of a, a small community in a country will, will get it uh, and then tell friends on social media generally kind of and then it kind of goes viral and we get a kind of a spike uplift and that's pretty much the way that every country's switched on so brazil uh india vietnam philippines us uk starting to grow in places like romania um, nigeria um and it's all that kind of organic spike and then once it gets up to about a thousand two thousand people it just starts growing kind of organically that's fantastic. So, so I was going to ask you, um, you keep answering my questions before I ask them. So it's good, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was going to ask you who the users are, um, and what's their motivation. So maybe talk about some other use cases, um, that you're seeing of people who are signing up. Yeah, it's interesting. A different, markets have different drivers. Um, so for instance, in uh, Nigeria, um, we can kind of put out, a, a, we put out a small little exchange actually for a hundred people. Uh, we call it a data exchange, right? So um, we had about 50 people in Nigeria on the platform um, and put out a, an exchange for one pound for exchanging some data. Um, and we were up at about 500 people within four days. Um, 
so in that particular market, one pound is a, is a driver of, of uptake. Um, in Germany, the exact opposite would be true. And if we went out on social media and said, you can earn some money for, for your data, we basically get abused. Um, the driver in Germany is actually much more about control of data and having visibility of what's happening with your data mm -hmm. uh, and, and the ability to donate it uh, for good causes. Um, so it, it depends very much on the market that you're in. Um, and it depends also which clients we have. So something we're doing in Indonesia, for instance, is um, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, where you have uh, small holding palm oil farmers who um, are, are growing palm oil, and there's a massive issue with sustainable palm, palm oil, right? And basically uh, rainforests disappearing, et cetera. So we developed a, a rating scorecard with a, a UN offshoot called uh, Blue Number, uh, and they have developed a kind of a, it's about 20, 25 questions um, a, around the sustainable development goals. So smallholders, uh, and this is in Bahasa, Indonesia, can basically answer these questions on their smartphone and they can understand where they're aligned to the sustainable development goals and where maybe improve in terms of, say, farming practices, and then provides them with um, suggestions about ways that they can kind of um, align to the, SD the SDGs. Um, that's really, really helpful for large purchases of farm milk who want to go sustainable because they want to see from those small farmers which ones of them are, are really kind of aligned to the SDGs. Um, mm -hmm. So we're kind of benefiting the supply chain, um, but also benefiting the individual farmers because if they can show that they have a particular score, um, they, that almost becomes almost like certification. It, it shows the people who are purchasing the, um, the palm oil that they really are kind of using sustainable practices. Um, there are some ways that that can be checked as well, because basically you have location, so you can see where that farmer is without needing, needing to know who they are, but you can then kind of map that against heat maps for, for forest fires and things. So if people are doing slash and burn and burning down the rainforest, you can then check if the SDGs against that, those, those kind of maps. So you have kind of validation, but you also have kind of the, the ability to uh, enable kind of the, the farmers to self-improve. So that, I mean, that's some, that's some pretty ethical uh, stuff you got going but on. It's, there, it's, so. no, it's ethical, but it's also, um, it's, it's sensible and it's, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense and um, sounds like you've thought those, you know, those groups through and, um, but so I have a quote here um, because I was going to ask you, you know, could there be dangers? Um, what's the bad that could happen once it's, once the data is out there, once you sell your data, can't it be used against you? Um, and here's the quote from um, Mark Roy, um, a writer that wrote, uh, consumers are not interested in signing over their data for a small fee only have only to have it abused further down the line the fair exchange that consumers want is not or is the one where their information is protected and their choices respected so how do you respond to that so firstly the by default everything has to be anonymous uh, companies don't generally need personal deep personal information um, some mm -hmm. markets think they do because it might be useful later on or they might want to kind of link an ID, but actually a lot of the time, it's really the insight that people need and the insight can come from anonymized data. So for a thousand, thousand customers, what are the things this, this particular kind of segment of my customer base really, really want? And you don't need to have deeply personalized information for that. Um, so the first, first rule is basically privacy by design and design everything around the human, around the individual, um, so that you keep everything anonymous by default. Um, if you then kind of open up, uh, for us, you, you go into a private community where you might be invited into a community by, I don't know, for instance, a credit card um, or by a travel company, and they want to do deeper research, which in market research terms would be called qualitative research, where you actually speak to someone. Um, if you do that, you do that inside a private community where the brand is visible to you. So it could be a travel brand, for instance, and they're asking you, 
questions, but you're doing it in a very reciprocal way. Um, and any kind of request for personal data is clearly permissioned and consented because it's in a effectively a data conversation. Um, and then beyond that, kind of any the condition is that any um, data that's shared is is for the sole use of that travel company. So it, it can't be sold on to any third party. And at that, that kind of stage, actually, you're, you're talking about kind of smaller groups um, and more conversational kind of interaction as well. Um, mm -hmm. So everything we design in summary is basically privacy uh, by default. Um, it's um, pre sorry, privacy by design and it's kind of um, anonymized by default. Mm -hmm. um so good answer to that question. Now there's another one, um, but this is more, you know, you've heard about uh, the situation of the data economy being referred to as the Davids and the Goliaths. Uh, big tech players like Google and Facebook would be the Goliaths and you guys and individuals would be the Davids. What do you say to this? Um, I, <laughs> it's a, <laughs> It's an interesting, I mean, like if you look at the kind of the my days to community, right? I mean, we, we have a lot of smaller companies which um, are trying to kind of change the way that the internet works. I mean, I think for me, it's it's not quite as adversarial. Um, companies like Google and, and well, Facebook, I don't know, um, something like <laughs> Google and Apple will be around for the, the rest of the century. Uh, I'm sure Facebook will be too. It, it's more around um, how they participate and how they interact with everyone else. So we, we need to have services which represent us as individuals to enable us to interact, interact mm -hmm. uh, on equal terms. So it's not really kind of like David and Goliath. It's, it's about parity and participation. Uh, and mm -hmm. we just need services which enable us to do that kind of uh, en masse. Uh, and those, those are starting to come through. Um, the, the David Goliath stuff is kind of interesting when you look at kind of, there are companies like kind of Mozilla, obviously, and Facebook and, and um, Firefox. Um, and it, you tend to kind of pitch smaller, smaller company as large. If you look at the dynamics behind that, actually, you know, Firefox make what, 500 million a year, primarily from Google for advertising referrals. Um, so mm -hmm. even though those are kind of pitched by say journalists as being kind of David versus Goliath, actually it's much more of an ecosystem than that. And it's really kind of trying to work out how we can have services, as I say, which kind of enable us to participate directly in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we talk about privacy by design and actually our last uh, show was with our CFO uh, and co-founder um, of IDCA, which is a private, you know, a platform for um, private groups and organizations to collaborate in a in a kind of a walled garden, uh, like the old walled garden where everything was kept inside this container and nothing could get out. So, what do you think about what do you think about a service like that? I think that's the way that things are moving, right? I mean, that's kind of Web three distributed tech. There are, there's some regulatory issues. Um, but actually, a lot of the regulatory questions, if you apply them to the offline world, yeah, we already have rules for these things, right? So, I mean, so yes. first, so firstly, I think that that's the way the world's moving. I mean, even WhatsApp is becoming encrypted. They really want the social graph more than actually what the messages say. Um, so, right. it's still very valuable to what for, for WhatsApp, still very valuable in terms of social graph for Facebook, but they don't actually want to see the content. The actual social graph should be up to you to define and should be private to whatever that community is as well, right? Um, if you look at um, mm -hmm. the mail, um, certainly in Europe and the US, basically tampering with the federal post in the States is a, is an offense, right? So you can't actually look inside. Right. Um, and you need a warrant. So if you want to do anything um, in terms of kind of um, invasion of privacy like that. And in the online world, we should be exactly the same. Um, so we should start with privacy. And then if there are exceptions to that, where you need to, f for whatever reason, basically kind of for legal reasons, basically um, kind of see some additional information, it should be through a judge and should be consented. Um, so I, we already have these mechanisms in place. For me, it's kind of the, the place we should have been in the first place. Um, um, right. We've kind of had this wild west 
where we're saying, oh, it's an entirely new world and we need new rules. Actually, no, we just need to take some of the old rules and just apply them to where we are. Um, and it's kind of really quite straightforward, I think. Um, so we're kind of getting back to where we should be, I think, is my answer. I agree. I mean, we have our human rights and privacy is one of them. And yeah. we there is no difference anymore between our physical world and our digital one. So let's, you know, but it's tough because there are borders online. Um, so it's tough, but we could go that's, yeah, on and on about that. And that's too. a massive issue. I, yeah. yeah, I don't have to go for the and that's, that's a massive issue in terms of kind of fragmentation and kind of what's happening with, you know, you've got national rules and you've got kind of a global internet. Um, but then things like GDPR coming through, I mean, most states now are going to kind of pick up on GDPR and have a version of that. Um, and we're actually seeing kind of the start of a bit, bit of an arms race where um, talking with a, a large uh, country in, in East Asia, which is looking at going beyond GDPR because they don't want to just be following GDPR. They want to have rules which are um, better than GDPR. So you're going to actually start having some competition about who has the highest, you know, the, the, the best kind of level of, um, of protections. And that's kind of where we want to get to, right? Um, so you've got kind of CCPA coming through, you've got legislation coming through in Canada, you've got um, a lot of stuff happening in Asia, um, India coming, coming through regulation. So um, I actually think we're probably going to see a lot of change in the next five years or so. Um, the problem for companies that have been playing the Wild West is they're kind of driving to the speed limit. So the speed limit's, I don't know, 70 miles an hour, and they're kind of driving 75 and just over over the speed limit but the speed limit is coming down uh, and that's a problem because if your entire business models about running at 70 miles an hour and suddenly the speed limit's 40 you've kind of got a problem right you so might we'll see get, you might get a ticket <laughs> yeah which <laughs> and the other thing we're seeing is that certainly in europe um the regulators are starting to find their range in terms of and also their kind of their teeth in terms of what kind of tickets they're going to start issuing mm -hmm. um with the the ICO in the UK is now saying that real time bidding and ad tech is is illegal under G, GDPR and they're kind of on warning. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big industry. Yeah. Um, so there, there are some big changes that are going to start coming because that that industry runs on personal data. Yeah. I have a lot more to come in the next year, I think. Well, thank you for that. Um... And I, we're kind of out of time for today already. I can't believe it, it goes by so fast. It does. Um, do you have any parting thoughts for the audience? What do you want to leave people with today? That's, um, that's a really good question. I'd say um, there is hope. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, there, there, as I said, there's so much change happening. Um, I think kind of participating, this is kind of blowing our trumpet a bit, but kind of getting involved in services that are trying to do it getting involved in, in think people like me, de my data, um, organizations which are kind of pushing the, pushing the, the new frontier, if you like. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of incredibly important. Participate, stay involved, and you'll make change happen. Awesome. Yeah, I, I agree. And ITCA's doing our part. So I hope, uh, hope everyone will join us on that platform as well. Sinjin, thank you so much yeah. for being with us today. Fascinating topic. Uh, wishing you all the best with your endeavors. Um, I'm going to check you guys out a little bit in more detail. Um, as a reminder, this show is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel on ubngo.com slash good tech and as a podcast on iTunes or any other platform you might choose. Uh, for more updates, visit us on idka.com where you can uh, join the open group all about idka and talk to us uh, in real time, connect with us there. Any questions for Sinjin or myself, please leave us a note in the comments section. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for joining us today. Have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world. And we'll see you again on the next Good Tech. Bye, everyone.